All right. Welcome to the study group. Welcome, Chuck. Thank you, Derek. Welcome, everyone at home. Today, we're going to be talking about the evolutionary races of color. This is going to be a really fun topic. It's going to touch on history, uh, modern day science, and it'll give us an opportunity to continue the story of where we left off. If you remember, we started with Andon and Fanta, the first two human beings, and now we're going to build from that. So we were at a million BC last time. Now we're gonna kind of jump forward. But Chuck did a really great job of putting together these slides and this title slide right here on our episode of this podcast. And we just wanna set the stage for the diversity of this, of this yeah, episode. Yeah. Sure enough. So some of the topics that we're gonna be covering on this show are- Yeah, so here's the slide. It's kind of our roadmap for today. And it's fairly simple, but there's a lot of interesting complexity within each of these topics. So we'll begin by just talking a little bit about the origin of the colored races, how they came into being. And then we'll look at each one, there's six. We'll take a little time to look at each one and their characteristics and their fate and what happened. And this is all very long ago, so it's important to remember that as a context. And then, um, we'll look at their uh, sort of a summary of where they all ended up after their migrations over the first few hundred thousand years of their existence. And then finally, we'll take a peek into the future and how the, the existence of these races and their fate and how all that shook out and what that points to going forward. Okay. So before we move forward with the whole study, I think it's important that we get clear on a few topics and, yeah. and words. Exactly. Yeah. So exactly. we, we, Put together some definitions of some terms that we're going to be using in this study group mm -hmm. and that'll allow so that we're kind of have some coherence as we go forward right so in these definitions it's important to remember that these are definitions that help us with the telling of this story they don't necessarily correspond exactly to current understanding of these things but they do carry us forward in our understanding from the ranch book of these topics and they will, they're important to our understanding of this story that we're telling. So today it's just one piece of that story. There's a much longer arc, but these terms are relevant to understanding. So right off the bat, what do we mean by a human being? <laughs> so these races are human races. And the Arantia book helps us understand that as a human being, I am a child of God. That's my truest identity. And that I have a body, but my body is of evolutionary origin. I'm going to leave it behind when we, you know, we leave our bodies behind when we leave this planet, but we carry with us a potential future of eternal destiny. So this is all wrapped up in what it means to be a human being. And the concept of evolution is very important in all of this. And the way the Ranch Book talks about evolution is a little different from the way current day science understands it. But I'll give a definition here that I think will work for our purposes, which is that evolution is a technique of biological creation that is initiated and guided by ministries of mind and spirit. So this is a concept that we derive from the Arantia book that evolution is purposeful. It has a creative purpose behind it. And then we'll see more about that. But it's not just a random thing. Right. And then just to kind of frame all of this, I thought it would be helpful to clarify two words because race, of course, is such a touchy issue as we all know. Sure. So there's the term racial and there's the term racist. And these words have etymological roots and also popular culture adoption in different ways. But the essential difference here is that racial has to do with objective, or at least the way we're going to use these terms, has to do with objective observation whereas a racist is somebody obviously with a bad attitude. So to expand on that, racial relates to the major groupings into which humankind can be divided on the basis of observed characteristics and shared ancestry. And it relates to or is based on the object objective study of race, impartial, non-emotional, just sort of more of a Scientific, scientific and observational yeah. understanding. Whereas racist and racism pertains to prejudice, discrimination, or antagonism toward a person or people on the basis 
of their membership in a particular racial or ethnic group. So we're not going there. <laughs> but we are going to be studying, in a sense, some very significant racial factors in our human nature. Okay. So, so maybe, maybe we need yeah. to plot the course of what, what yeah. this history has entailed for us. And we're going to put together, our, we put together a timeline mm -hmm. here that maybe you might want to screen capture, but it allow for reference points so we know when these migrations were, if you want to talk, yeah. just briefly talk about that. Yeah. Really so quickly. I'm not going to go through this in detail now, but as we proceed, you'll see how we're flowing through this timeline. So this is something you can come back to later and refresh or do a screen capture, like Derek said. And we'll re refer back to it a couple of times. But this shows the span of time that we're talking about, from about 500,000 years ago till about 75,000 years ago. So also from this timeline, at the top, we can see that these races, these colored races, all appeared within a single family. So this is a very unusual phenomenon, evolutionarily. And as you follow down the chart, down the timeline, you can see when all of these different groups began their migrations. So migration of the races is a big part of this story because they went to different parts of the world. And we can even see the legacy of that in today's distributions of people. But this gives us a start into understanding that. Cool. Yeah. Th thanks for putting that together. All right. Well, how about we just get started with some quotes and we'll yeah. dive into it. Yeah, let's do. Okay, so we're just kind of continuing the story and... So this next group of slides are about the origin of the races. Okay. And then we'll get into the races individually after that. Yeah. Okay. All right. So evolution on your rancha or elsewhere is always purposeful and never accidental. The early stages of life evolution are not altogether in conformity with your present day views. Mortal man is not an evolutionary accident. So mm. again, more of this purposeful. Yeah, planning. exactly. And now where we're picking up our story, 500,000 years ago, during the fifth advance of the ice, a new development accelerated the course of human evolution. Suddenly, and in one generation, the six colored races mutated from Andonite parents. So our last show, we talked about the first humans, mm -hmm. Andon and Fanta, mm -hmm. who created the Andonite race. Yeah, they were the progenitors of the Andonite race. And now we're going to fast forward 500,000 years. So we went from 1 million BC to now 500,000 BC. Uh -huh. And the descendants of Andon and Fanta in one particular tribe and in one particular family mm -hmm. is the foundation of these Sangic races in one family. Right. So we'll, we'll look at that. And the Andonites, by that time, had spread all over. But there were different groups that were uh, carried the higher potentials of that race. So that's what we're going to be looking at next is the parents of these Sangig races. But I wanted to point out one thing, which is the, the, the phrase, a new development accelerated the course of human evolution. So in terms of understanding what they mean by evolution, that's where it's important to go back to that definition, which is that there's evolutionary potentials within these races that are now being released Good through, point. through this natural process. Okay, thanks. Okay, continuing on. The Sangic family, the ancestors of all of the six colored races of Urantia, this group was located in the foothills of the northwestern Indian highlands among the tribes of Badanon, a great-great-grandson of Andon. So this tribe of Badanon, Badanon being the progenitor of the Badanite, Badanites, where, which was this tribe that the Sangik family eventually sprung out of. Emerged from, yes. Mm -hmm. And this was a descendant of Andon and Fanta, who then generations and generations and generations down the road 500,000 years in that same tribe uh -huh. then we get the Sengik family popping up right exactly okay so next one concurrent with the appearance of the six colored or Sengik races so this is what they're calling the colored races Sengik so mm -hmm. we have a new term here Kalagastya the planetary prince arrived on Urantia 
There were almost one half billion primitive human beings on earth at the time of the prince's arrival, and they were well scattered over Europe, Asia, and Africa. The prince's headquarters, established in Mesopotamia, was at about the center of world population. So we can go to the map and we can show this stuff, but it, it, it's basically at 500,000 BC, when the world is pretty much populated with primitive life and these singic races are popping up, these colored races are popping up, we get this planetary prince arrival mm -hmm. and he's tasked with a lot of evolutionary responsibilities. On exactly, that's a good way of putting it. Yeah, and part of those responsibilities was uh, cultivating these six new races and educating them creating a center of culture. And this actually, we're going to get into this in our next podcast. So I don't want to give away too much, but that responsibility was very important. Yeah, thanks. Okay, so let me just guys, let, let me just show you guys where we're at in the okay. world here. Good idea. And so when they talk about Dalmatia, this is right at the mouth of the Persian Gulf, right? Something like that. That's where the planetary mm -hmm. prince arrives, 500,000 BC. When we talk about the highlands of India, we're looking over here. Here's India. And we're going, we're picking this spot as the highlands right here where the Sengic family pops up. Mm -hmm. And then from there, we have the six colored races and their migrations. And we will get into that further. So all these migrations start from that area. And spread out. And spread out. As we'll see. Okay, so let me find my next quote. There's a lot of stuff in this study group, so bear I with know. us here, please. <laughs> bear with us. Okay. The Sangic children, 19 in number, were not only intelligent above their fellows, but their skins manifested a unique tendency to turn various colors upon exposure to sunlight. These colors became more profound as the children grew older. And when these youths later mated with their fellow tribesmen, all of their offspring tended toward the skin color of the Sangic parent. Of the six colored Sangic races, three were primary and three were secondary. Hmm. So, um, well, they, they said there they become more pronounced as the children grow older. So these colors kind of intensified not only under sunlight, but in subsequent generations of within these different, six different groups. And it's interesting, another sort of preview of coming attractions is the idea that there are six of these colors. And we know there's seven colors in the rainbow. And there's a lot of sevens running through all phases of universe creation. So there is actually a seventh race coming, which is the violet race. So when we talk about these six colors, the six primary and the six secondary, there's this, the octave, or one way of looking at it, that's coming later is the violet race. And that's an imported race, and we'll be looking at that separately later on. But just to kind of complete that range of colors, begin to see a coherence in those colors. And we know that, and we also know from working with computers even, how those colors mix and what results we get from that. Right, right. Thanks for that. Mm -hmm. And you know, yes, and we'll continue on with this story. Yeah, I mean, we're at five hundred thousand BC. Adam and Eve and the Violet Race come in around thirty-eight thousand BC. So that's later. And that's later. So right now we're just going to start with the foundation, the uh, right. fountainhead of racial inheritance. Mm -hmm. of but they species. bring the crowning race, the Violet Race, which crowns the other six and is intended to be mixed with all of them. So that's the kind of the the plan, at least. Okay. So back to where we were, yeah. 500,000 BC. Going back. <clears throat> back to these colored races. They say, these early colored races were extraordinarily tested by the rigors and hardship of the glacial age of their origin. The Sengic tribes were fairly industrious when residing away from the tropics, but there was a long, long struggle between the lazy devotees of magic and the apostles of work those who exercised foresight. So this is kind of a, they're talking about kind of a character struggle within each race. This isn't pitting one race against another, but all the races I think experience this, which is that there is tended to be a division between those who think if I just wish and hope, maybe what I want will happen, 
right? And maybe if I do this or that, you know, that there could be a, it's sort of a magic was kind of the first impulse of the human races to influence future outcomes. You know, so there's all kinds of magical practices that got involved with that. But then there were others who understood by exercising foresight, they could visualize a future, but understand that they had to work to make that future happen. Yeah. yeah. So those are the industrious ones. And there was actually a conflict between these groups. Well, it also sounds like some of the industriousness that was necessary was battling glacial ages. Right. Advancement of ice, which yeah. isn't exactly easy. And I'm sure there were yeah. big beasts on the oh, planet. Oh, man, all kinds too. of problems. So they're pointing out that all the races began under these very difficult circumstances, which was kind of intended to bring out the strongest and the best among them. Okay, cool. All right, continuing on. Thus it was for almost 100,000 years, these Sengic people spread out around the foothills and mingled together more or less, notwithstanding the peculiar but natural antipathy, which early manifested itself between the different races. So there was a natural kind of mm -hmm. clashing going on between cultural differences probably within the yeah, races. Which made each one of these races kind of go off by itself from the others, which had evolutionary significance. But the thing to remember here is that they were confined by the ice for the first 100,000 years, which means they weren't able to migrate any great distance from their origin. But they grew in numbers, but were still in, this, in the same general area. Okay. Uh, but sorting themselves out because of their antipathy for each other. So that's kind of an, apparently a natural, they call it a natural antipathy, which suggests to me that it has an evolutionary purpose. Well, if they all started in the same place, right, and then they were mm -hmm. kind of roaming around these foothills as we as talking about, uh -huh. that's their natural an antipathy or whatever would allow them to then want to scatter out, right, to move away. Uh huh. But for now, they're still within the same general region, right, in those foothills yeah. of Upper India. Okay. So now we're going to start on the colored races, yep, specifically. Yep, and they have a sequence. All right, so just like the colors of the rainbow, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, mm -hmm. violet. Yeah. It's the same with the colored races. Exactly. So we're going to start with red. The red man. These peoples were remarkable specimens of the human race, in many ways superior to Andon and Fanta. They were a most intelligent group and were the first of the Sengic children to develop a tribal civilization and government. They were always monogamous. Even their mixed descendants seldom practiced plural mating. So, yeah, just to set the stage. Of yeah, right. This, this is just a kind of a general overview. Of what kind of people they were. Okay, uh, continuing with the quotes. Yeah. The red men early began to migrate to the northeast on the heels of the retreating ice, passing around the highlands of India and occupying all of northeastern Asia. They were closely followed by the yellow tribes who subsequently drove them out of Asia into North America. And we can go back to the map if you want and we can kind of Yeah, just for a second. A Get a lay of the land. So, if we're looking at red man coming up around the Tibetan area and, and the Asian area and going northeast around mm -hmm. here and then heading up further north. And then yellow men, as they said, were quickly coming to them, mm -hmm. or following them, and where red men eventually had to leave the continent and go into North America. And we'll get into that mm -hmm. again. Okay, great. So here's a cool one. The red men were aided by their early invention of the bow and arrow, but they had unfortunately inherited much of the tendency of their ancestors to fight among themselves. And this so weakened them that the yellow tribes were able to drive them off the Asiatic continent. So as we showed you on the map, uh -huh. that was where they got pushed towards the Bering Strait. And we'll, and we'll read more about that in just a second. Uh-huh. 100,000 years ago, when the land passage to the west over the Bering Isthmus became passable 
These tribes were not slow in forsaking the inhospitable shores of the Asiatic, of the Asiatic continent. About 85,000 years ago, the comparatively pure remnants of the red race went en masse across to North America. And shortly thereafter, the Bering land isthmus sank, thus isolating them. But throughout Siberia, China, Central Asia, India, and Europe, they left behind much of their stock blending with the other colored races. So as we saw on the map here in the Bering Strait, mm. that's where they crossed when they were kind of pushed out by the yellow man. And then they entered into North America. And they talk about, you know, still in Siberia and other regions that there's still this kind of uh, stock left mm -hmm. of red man. Yeah, all right. And even even modern science can make those connections Begin to, to see that. Siberia and Alaska and some of North America. Yeah, yeah. So there's always this tension going on between mixing and fighting <laughs> that we'll see. Uh, this antipathy between the races was sometimes overcome and by just being in the same area at the same time, and they would mix and blend. But more often, they would fight and drive one away, one or the other away. So just imagine that whole realm of, of China, you know, like the Tarim Basin, which was fertile back then, and that whole other regions. I mean, that was hugely desirable area to plant yourself. So the, the red men and the yellow men fought over that whole continent for, yeah. for 200,000 years, they say. We'll, we'll see area. a little more about that, but just to get a sense of what the significance of this. 200,000 years yeah. is a long time. Man. Yeah. Okay, next quote. When the relatively pure line remnants of the red race forsook Asia, there were 11 tribes, and they numbered a little over 7,000 men, women, and children. These tribes were accompanied by three small groups of mixed ancestry, the largest of these being a combination of the orange and blue races. These three groups never fully fraternized with the red man and early journeyed southward to Mexico and Central America, where they were later joined by a small group of mixed yellows and reds. So there were a few um, other evolutionary race, colored races that snuck across the Bering Strait well, essentially yeah, right. with red man, but they didn't hang out with red man. Right. They made a beeline down to Central and South exactly. America. Yeah. And also just look at the, this number, 7,000 men, women, and children. That's all there was left of the red race at that point in time after this huge battle with the yellow race. race. So this, if you think that's a very small number, <laughs> you know, you consider, you know, racial populations in general, but those were the surviving members of the red race. And, you know, they then proceeded to take over North America and, you know, populate the region. And Central. Central. And then this, and these South. other combinations then went on to Central America and even South America. Yeah, so, um, let's read a little more here. Let's go. These peoples all intermarried. So we were talking about the, Amalgama the, mixed. the amalgamated mixed orange and blue. Right, the ones who left the Pure Line Reds behind. And went to Central and South America. Right, exactly. These people all intermarried and founded a new and amalgamated race one which was much less warlike than the pure line red men. Within 5,000 years, this amalgamated race broke up into three groups, establishing the civilizations respectively of Mexico, Central America, and South America, mm -hmm. which we would then look at looking at some of this ancient um, iconography where we're talking about the yeah. Aztec, the Maya, and the Inca. Uh-huh. The predecessors to that right then this the, big guy over here in the bottom right corner is olmec so that's one of the offshoots yeah and there's phenotypes ex expressed in this uh -huh. that draws this is why we used it because it does have phenotypes that we found that kind of reflect blue and orange mixed yes yeah and and you'll see some similarities in some of that stuff in some of the egyptian busts mm -hmm. yeah in iconography and we'll get into some of that as right. we as we continue on and owing to the fact that these amalgamated groups were more peaceful they were more successful in establishing visible remnants of civilization that we can see in these images 
Right. It's much more advanced. Right. I'm sure a lot of people have seen like all those um, ancient civilization shows yeah, on right. Netflix and stuff where they're always like talking about Olmec yeah, or the people Incas and the and Inca, and Machu Picchu all and all that stuff. Yeah. And like, whoa, it was aliens or whatever. But <laughs> we'll get we'll get into some of that and learn some of those details. <clears throat> okay. So this is going back to saying <clears throat> a little bit more about the red race. When the red man crossed over into America, he brought along much of the teachings and traditions of his early origin. But in a short time after reaching the Americas, these people again fell into fighting so fiercely among themselves that it appeared that these tribal wars would result in the extinction of this remnant of the comparatively pure red race. The red men seemed doomed when about 65,000 years ago, Anamanalantan appeared as their leader and spiritual deliverer. Mm -hmm. So this is so the guy. They, yeah, so when they talk about the teachings of their origin, traditions of their origin, that's going back to Dalmatia. Mm -hmm. uh, which we're going to get into <laughs> next. But there was a civilization there that taught high spiritual teachings. So they had retained some of that mm -hmm. and then lost it and then regained it with Anamanalantan. Right, right. Well, let's read this slide because it kind yeah, of it's in definitely. place. Anamanalantan brought temporary peace among the American red men and revived their worship of the great spirit. He lived to be 96 years of age and maintained his headquarters among the great redwood trees of California. Yeah, just imagine that. <laughs> well, we if you've ever been to the redwoods, they're very cathedral-like. And it, the idea of an inspiring spiritual teacher in that setting is very compelling. Well, if we go in there, this is kind of where uh -huh. it would be. Yeah. So yeah. we're tucked in the redwoods. This is actually a location that I, I went to in 2014 with the support of uh, another year book reader, Dave Holt, mm. who did a great uh, article on. Yeah, he's on done a, a lot of time. research on this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so he supported a lot of my uh, adventures yeah. Yeah, in, yeah, yeah, in yeah. finding this place. But there is this uh, Sumeg village, and it's uh, the place is called Patrick's Point, and it's known by some of the locals as huh. the last dwelling place of the immortals. Wow. And there's some really cool cool spots there mm. where you can almost picture among the redwoods on Mount Lantan. Holding giving, forth. Yeah, yeah, About yeah. the great spirit. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And I was blessed to be able to go there. Thanks, Dave. Okay, so on to the next color. Red, orange. Red, then orange. The orange race was the first to follow the coastline southward toward Africa. As the Mediterranean Sea withdrew to the west, but they never secured a favorable footing in Africa and were wiped out of existence by the later arriving green race. So we'll get, we'll get into some of these migrations. Mm -hmm. um, hold on a second. Going through all these quotes is <laughs> a lot. Um, but there was this pathway established into Africa that actually three of the races end up ended up taking. So they say southward toward Africa, uh, as the Mediterranean Sea withdrew to the west, that opened up a pathway to go down through the what we now know as Palestine and into Africa. So, yeah, and I'll show you too yeah. here in a second. I got it together here. Great. The last great struggle between the orange and the green men occurred in the region of the lower Nile Valley in Egypt. The long drawn out battle was waged for almost 100 years. And, as, and, and at its close, very few of the orange race were left alive. The shattered remnants of these people were absorbed by the green and by the later arriving indigo men. But as a race, the orange man ceased to exist about 100,000 years ago. So let me show you on the map now mm -hmm. um, what it kind of looks like here. Yeah. Let me and zoom out of California and come back to where we started. So if we look at the orange man migration shooting west, and at this time in um, geological placement, the Mediterranean was further to the east. Mm -hmm. So here's the Mediterranean, and it was way further, almost tucked up to the Persian Gulf. Mm -hmm. So as that receded west, 
orange man started to migrate west. Right, exactly. And they made this kind of beeline out here to um, Palestine. And they were the first of the races to do that. Yeah, so they were the first ones through Palestine, and then they said followed the coast down into Egypt, where then they were followed by green and decimated, essentially, and absorbed by the green were then followed by indigo right we'll get into more of those details in a little bit Mm -hmm. so there was a great revival of higher living as a result of the wise leadership of porshunta the mastermind of the orange race who ministered to them when their headquarters was at armageddon some three hundred thousand years ago the outstanding characteristic of the orange race was their peculiar urge to build to build anything and everything, even the piling up of vast mounds of, of stone just to see which tribe could build the largest mounds. Yeah. So it's pretty interesting now, if we go back to the map and we look at this region uh-huh. well, where they, look, they were. Yeah, Armageddon is in Palestine. Uh, so if we look at the map down here, Armageddon is called Megiddo. Okay. And that's where then Porshunta mm-hmm. ministered to them, right? So right. it was known as modern day Megiddo. There's kind of a cool little ruins going over there. But if we look at the line of migration for the orange man through Palestine, we look at them coming near the Sea of Galilee. And there's this really interesting spot that we found that there's an article here that I'm gonna I'm gonna share with you real quick. And that's in the Sea of Galilee, there's this like huge stone mound. <laughs> and, and nobody knows what the heck's going on there. And they say it's 4,000 years ago, but they say, but it could be a lot older. Right, which it probably is. Yeah, yeah. And so I'm just going to kind of scroll through this. But one really cool thing is, so you look at these stones and they're like, basically, man, these guys just started piling these stones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so it's interesting how then, you know, the Urantia book talks about how orange men loved to pile and build. Uh-huh. So in these orange man mounds, you know, it's here. Let me go back to this article. They they show where it is. So here's the Sea of Galilee, uh-huh. right? And then they kind of show that these mounds are right here, just off the coast, right here. Oh yeah, look at that. So that it's kind of essentially right there. Uh huh. So you know, even if you wanted to like maybe have a look. You can have this like kind of, okay, let's look. They're like right there. That's, <laughs> <laughs> that's where these huge orange man mounds are. Apparently, yeah, yeah. According, ac- according to our theories. Right, but it's but, very mysterious yeah. for archaeologists and others. To, what, what are these piles of rocks doing here? Yeah, very it's interesting. Great, it's a great mystery. Yeah. Uh, but you, we, can, we can remember that their headquarters of the orange race, they say, was at Armageddon at that time. So they parked there for a while. And this is before the other, you know, the green race and the indigo race ca- yeah, kind of came upon them. There. And you look at the the proximity uh-huh. of Sea of Galilee and Armageddon. Yeah, yeah. They're practically right in the same area. Yeah, it seems like it could be probable. Very plausible. So this is when things were good with the orange race. <laughs> They weren't being attacked by other races. They had Porshunta uh, uh, teaching them spiritually. And it looked like things were on the up and up with the orange race. But then they got chased into Africa where they met their doom. Yeah. And we'll, and we'll touch on how maybe yeah. modern day influences still exist and things like that. Right. Okay. So on to the next color. So we did the uh, piling the rocks. Yeah. Image. Okay. Yeah. That's what. Got it. Led to the Sea of Galilee got piling it, got out it, of the rocks. It. Okay, cool. Okay. On to the yellow race. The yellow tribes were the first to establish settled communities and develop a home life based on agriculture. Socially and collectively, they proved themselves superior to all of the Sangic peoples in the matter of fostering racial civilization. Okay, so... More than 300,000 years ago, the main body of the yellow race entered China from the south as coastwise migrants. Each millennium, they penetrated farther and farther inland. 
growing population pressure caused the northward moving yellow race to begin to push into the hunting grounds of the red man. This encroachment, coupled with natural racial antagonism, culminated in increasing hostilities and thus began the crucial struggle for the fertile lands of farther Asia. Just mm -hmm. to look at the map again, if we want to go back there. Yeah, yeah, let's do. Okay. So, so the red race was already in that region, having come around from the north, as you can see there. And then the yellow race was circling around from the south. And they ended up running into each other <laughs> in the huge stretches of that area. And the fight was on for the hunting grounds. And, and the land. fight was on, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let me zoom in there a little bit so you can see some of this stuff, how they followed. Uh-huh south and these guys went north right so the pathways of these migrations were often determined by either terrain or glaciers or other factors but in here i think it's mostly terrain so they had to kind of go around the highlands and they chose two different routes to do that but inevitably clashed inevitably met in the desirable areas where the agriculture was good and there was plenty of hunting yeah okay well the story of this age-long contest between the red and yellow races is an epic of Urantia history. For over 200,000 years, these superior races waged bitter and unremitting warfare. Yeah, just have to kind of use your imagination on that one. But look at the size of the land area that's involved. It kind of explains how this could go on for 200,000 years. Well... In the earlier struggles, the red men were generally successful. Their raiding parties spread havoc among the yellow settlements. With their bows and arrows. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But the yellow man was an apt pupil in the art of warfare. Literally, they wrote the art of war. <laughs> and he early manifested a marked ability to live peaceably with his compatriots. The Chinese were the first to learn that in union, there's strength. Right. So there were two different kinds of warfare going on. There was warfare between the races, but then there was also warfare within the races. So like the red race and the blue race and some of the others had a lot of internal warfare, which weakened them. Whereas the yellow, for the most part, was able to avoid a lot of that, which made them strong enough to drive the red race always to the east. Yeah. Push them off the Asiatic continent. Right. Okay, their most advanced, the Yellow Race, their most advanced settlements were situated to the northwest of modern China in the regions bordering on Tibet. Because they developed a fraternal spirit, the various tribes learning to live together in relative peace, they were able to drive the Red Race before them as they gradually expanded into Asia. Mm -hmm. So as we showed um, mm -hmm. in the Red Migration, yeah. Where, when they crossed the Bering Strait, essentially yeah. they pushed them off that. And that term relative is important in there. <laughs> they were able to live together in relative peace. So like I was reading about the Great Walls of China recently, and those were built to separate yellow groups from each other because they were at war oftentimes. So it's not like they're totally peaceful, but not as aggressive as some of the other races. Right. Especially with themselves. So, and they confederated too. They had that ability to confederate into a large, you know, larger groups instead of just fighting all the time. So, okay. this is an important feature of okay. that race. And now moving on to their leadership, there occurred a brilliant age among the yellow race when Sing Langton, about 100,000 years ago, assumed the leadership of the tribes and proclaimed the worship of the one truth. Yes. The worship of the truth was provocative of research and fearless of exploration of the laws of nature and the potentials of mankind. The Chinese of even 6,000 years ago were still keen students and aggressive in their pursuit of truth. The survival of comparatively large numbers of the yellow race is due to their intertribal peacefulness. From the days of Sing Langton to the times of modern China, 
The yellow race has been numbered among the more peaceful of the nations of Urantia. So this idea of being students of the truth, I think is a very interesting point they're making there. That St. Langton had revealed the importance of truth as a reality on so many levels. And they grasped that somehow. And that was contributed a lot to their civilization. Yeah. Even and even carried on forward. I mean, say, later yeah. on, we learn about these other. Lots of. And all others. those. Moti. Who came up late. Moti, yeah. yeah it yeah. came up later. But it all has roots in these earlier teachings of Sang Lang, Sing Langton. Cool. Okay. Well, to a, a certain extent, the early red and yellow men mingled in Asia. And the offspring of this union journeyed on to the east and along the southern seacoast, and eventually were driven by the rapidly increasing yellow rays onto the peninsulas and nearby islands of the sea. Right. So the, this is a whole other racial group that we see in existence today. So as we see red and yellow amalgamating a little bit and then pushing out these guys on off the peninsula into more of these island regions. Right. So like the Philippines and Taiwan. Some of, some of those other Asian yeah. regions were occupied by this new amalgamated race. So just like over in uh, Central and South America, you have an amalgamated race with its own kind of characteristics and future. We're seeing the same thing here as well. Okay. All right. Well. Okay. So now we're going to talk about the green race. <laughs> it's going to be interesting. All right. So here we have the green race. The green race was greatly weakened by extensive migrations in different directions. <laughs> Before their dispersion, these tribes experienced a great revival of culture under the leadership of Fantad some 350,000 years ago. So here we have, here they're saying that this race, the green race, unlike any of the others, the other five races all held together in their migrations. They all moved together. But the green race split up, which probably didn't serve them well, but it creates some interesting uh, traces that we can see manifesting. So going to the next slide, they say that the green race split into three major divisions. The northern tribes were subdued, enslaved, and absorbed by the yellow and blue races. So if you remember, the blue race was going north and- I can show them on the map. North and west. Yeah. Uh, and I'll, well, I'll read the rest of the quote. Yeah, cool. The Eastern group were amalgamated with those with the Indian peoples of those days, and remnants still persist among them. The Southern nation entered Africa, where they destroyed their orange cousins. So, we so were, if we look at the map, yeah, we can look at here's the starting point. As they mm -hmm. first said, some of the green went north, and they got subdued by the red and blue men over uh -huh. here, and then some went through India and ended up in Indochina area, uh -huh. Thailand, and some of them still persist there. Right. We'll get into. Mostly absorbed, but. And then the major migration was directly west into and then, Africa. And then south. And yeah. then south down. Right. Into Africa. So where they ran into the orange. <laughs> right, and then eventually the indigo. Yeah, and eventually the indigo followed them later. So the, the green race was sort of the middle race to attempt that migration route into Africa. And they were successful in getting there, but they ran into the orange race <laughs> and they had a battle to the death. For a hundred years or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah we'll, we'll get to that. So here's an interesting thing. So they're talking about this struggle between the uh, orange and green races. And they say that in many ways, the orange and green were evenly matched in their struggle since each carried strains of the giant order, many of their leaders being eight and nine feet in height. So we can see the legacy of this in this slide. <laughs> yeah, right away, you know, being a 90s baby where I, I can see Manute Bull and Muggsy Bogues right in the middle. Yeah. And, you know, as we get into some of the racial amalgamation in Africa and what happened after that. Uh-huh. We'll break it down a little bit, but you, where we can start to see this gigantic gene yeah. in North America eventually. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, some of them were brought to North America. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 
and so, in the NBA. <laughs> yeah. So these people, this guy on the right, uh, what was his name? Don somebody. But anyway, he was nine foot six or something. Eight foot six. Eight foot six. I don't want to get carried away. But yeah, he was eight foot six. And this woman on the left, she was close to eight foot herself. Mm -hmm. So these are extraordinary people. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Manu Bull was like seven four or something like that. Uh huh. But I like the juxtaposition with Muggsy Bogues, who kind of looks a little orange. I'm not going to lie. But uh -huh. this, we're all talking racially here. Yeah, or maybe a little green in there too. I don't know. For well, for Manute Bull. Yeah, Manute Bull, he does look a little bit like it, but whatever. We're just speculating based on the information of what we're working with here. But it's really interesting to see this giant order strain emerge mm -hmm. even in contemporary times. Yeah, and especially when maybe modern science might consider gigantism as some kind of abnormality or disease mm -hmm. or dysfunction. Uh huh. Um, with the Urantia book, we start to see maybe there is a reason why there's such yeah. gigantic bones out there and whatnot yeah, too. Yeah, right, right. Mm -hmm. Well, like this woman on the left, she was always perfectly proportioned, very strong, lived mm -hmm. a long, she lived to an old age. She was just really big. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Anyway, we can move on here. So more about the green rays. They say these giant strains of the green man were mostly confined to the Southern or Egypt Egyptian nation. The remnants of the victorious green men were subsequently absorbed by the indigo race, the last of the colored peoples to develop and migrate from the original Sangic center of race dispersion. So one more look at the map. Here we see the orange man came down, followed by the green men where they fought it out in Egypt. Yep. And then indigo man came in. Yeah. Right. Okay. So there's a sequence of those migrations. Okay. Next one. And then they point out, here's another just mixing detail. In Burma and the peninsula of Indochina, the cultures of India and China mixed and blended to produce the successive civilizations of those regions. Here, the vanished green race has persisted in larger proportion than anywhere else in the world. And that's as we showed before. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How they came down and came over here. Over there in Thailand. But the gigantic strain Went into was Egypt. in Egypt. Right. And that's kind of the more exciting part yeah. or whatever, for yeah. this show, if you want to get that way, because there is some connections with modern day society that are pretty fun. Yeah, right. So these remnants of the races that were wiped out still come up through yeah. the races that absorbed them. Yeah. And, then, you know, it's interesting if you look at through these regions of Palestine and in ancient biblical in the Old Testament, they always talk mm. about fighting the giants. Giants, yeah, that comes up a lot in the Bible. And so here, right through Sea of Galilee, right through all of Palestine, yeah. these guys are all in here, orange and green, uh -huh. and all the way into Egypt. And you can't tell me that, you know, in ancient times, there weren't still remnants of these oh, guys sure. around. Yeah. So part of fighting the giants was this as well. Yeah. Well, and those races fighting each other, too. Yeah. Yeah. Those are crazy times. Okay. Well, now we're going to move to the blue. Okay. So they say that the uh, blue men were a great people. They early invented the spear and subsequently worked out the rudiments of many of the arts of modern civilization. The blue man had the brain power of the red man associated with the soul and sentiment of the yellow man. Cool. And they, uh, here's a bit about their migration path. They say, since the fifth glacier did not extend so far into Europe, in Europe, the way was partially open for these Sangik peoples to migrate to the northwest. So this is a whole new direction that we haven't seen before. To the northwest. And upon the retreat of the ice, the blue men, together with a few other small racial groups, migrated westward along the old trails of the Andon tribes. They invaded Europe in successive ways, occupying most of the continent. So keeping in mind that the And Andonites were also in that region much earlier. If we follow their line of migration, yeah. is they, they followed the Andonite trails. Right. Kind of ended up here. Right. In this particular region. Mm -hmm. the, the blue race. The blue race did, yeah. Exactly. Okay. Keep Keeping going here. In Europe, they soon encountered the Neanderthal descendants of their early and common ancestor, 
andon. These older European Neanderthalers had been driven south and east by the glacier and thus were in position quickly to encounter and absorb their invading cousins of the Sangic tribes. Neanderthal absorption had greatly retarded the culture of the blue man, but he was otherwise the most aggressive, adventurous, and exploratory of all the evolutionary peoples of Eurasia, of this region we're talking about. But the thing about the Neanderthalers, they were essentially Andonites. So when you read and hear about Neanderthal, the Neanderthal people, they were essentially Andonites. But a lot of them had um, mixed, had unfortunate mixing <laughs> with their- More primitive types. With more primitive types. So mm -hmm. the Neanderthal race in general, even though they started out on a fairly high plane, had degraded over this long period of, you know, we're talking hundreds of thousands of years here. So the, the blue men, when they found the Neanderthals, they mixed to some extent, and that kind of brought down the, the blue race a right. bit. I mean, there's still some Neanderthal DNA yeah. in yeah. modern humans. Right. As we see in Cro-Magnon and, yeah. and Neanderthal. Right, and Neanderthal is andonite, so it's right. interesting to understand and that. And we learned that Cro-Magnon is blue. Right. He's yeah. a blue man. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So, uh, more about the blue men. Yeah. The blue men were perfectly honest in all their dealings. The early blue men were responsive to the persuasions of the teachers of Prince Caligastia's staff and were thrown into great confusion by the subsequent perverted teachings of these traitorous leaders. Like other primitive races, they never fully recovered from the turmoil produced by the Caligastia betrayal, nor did they ever completely overcome their tendency to fight among themselves. So this is getting a little bit of a hint of the purpose and intention of the Caligastia project before it rebelled, which was to help them overcome their tendency to fight among themselves. And this would have applied to all the races. So if that had been successful, there would have been surviving remnants of all six races that was sponsored by the Caligastia project at Dalmatia to be uplifted later by the violet race. But that went awry. But that went awry, south, so to speak, yeah. <laughs> in, in uh, two, you know, 200,000 years ago. So if we go back and look at that timeline, if you, if you go, no, we don't have to, well. We, we can, let me bring it up real okay. quick. Okay. We can see uh, that it's around 200,000. Right in the middle. Yeah, at about the time of the rebellion, which is 200,000 years ago, that all these races started fighting each other and having wars of uh, extermination and stuff like that. Yeah, genocidal wars. Genocidal wars. So that all followed after. I mean, the red-yellow conflict started before. But generally speaking, all these bad outcomes happened after 200,000 years ago, after the rebellion. And we're not saying that's the sole reason why. Right. But... It's up to speculation, but obviously there wasn't any stability on the planet at that point either. Right. So, right. So the teachings that would have preserved remnants of those races kind of got wiped out. So that's part of what's going on here. It's sort of between the lines. And that's foreshadowing for the next podcast. Yes, of. exactly. <laughs> okay. Okay. So speaking of the spiritual fate of the blue race, uh, here we have... Uh, this character entering the story. And they say about 500 years after Caligastia's downfall, so this is very shortly after the rebellion, a widespread revival of learning and religion occurred. Orlando became a great teacher among the blue race and led many of the tribes back to the worship of the true God under the name of the Supreme Chief. So this would have been a teaching that probably goes back to Dalmatia back to the days of Caligastia, but it was revived under this teacher, yeah. Orlandoff. Yeah. Uh, it's always interesting how the Orlando magic are blue. Hmm. Oh, yeah, team. look at that. Yeah. Huh. I know that's just kind of putting <laughs> well, things Well, you know, you but... never know. These things have yeah. roots, right? Yeah. <laughs> Even language and yeah. all that. So a little bit more about the blue race here. Uh, the blue men were hunters, fishers, and food gatherers. They were expert boat builders. 
They made stone axes, cut down trees, <laughs> erected log huts, partly below ground and roofed with hides. The European researches and explorations of the old Stone Age have largely to do with unearthing the tools, bones, and art craft of these ancient blue men. The strongholds of the blue men, which persisted the longest, were in southern France. So we can go on to this next slide here. They say that the blue men had courage, but above all, they were artists. Each child was carefully trained in the care of the caves, in art, and in flint making. So we've all seen these cave paintings, uh, I'm sure. But as I was researching these and I really got into looking at them, I really began to appreciate what good art this is, even by modern standards. These, the way they, the style and the way they do their markings and make these images is actually very sophisticated. Yeah. <laughs> if you look at them carefully. And Especially that carving. And very beautiful. And that carving, yeah. That's a very lifelike. I like how they say they, they, train, they were trained, carefully trained in the care of caves. The yeah. care of caves. Right. That's yeah. cool. So cool. And then they point out that, uh, well, so that some of these paintings are from southern France. Yeah. And they pointed out in, the, in that previous slide that that's where they persisted the longest. Where we have found all these caves. That's where we things. found all these things. Right. Okay. All right. So we're ready to move on to the indigo race? Let's do it. Okay. The indigo race was the last to migrate from their highland homes. So going all the way back to where we were pointing out where all these races originated and expanded and grew, the indigo were the last to migrate from that location. They journeyed to Africa, taking possession of the continent and have ever since remained there, except when they have been forcibly taken away. So it's kind of interesting, you know, this forcibly taken away, obviously we know what that could mean. Yeah. But also the some of the hidden blessings of some of the hardships on this planet, you know, it's like mm -hmm. forcibly taking away some of these giants <laughs> what, they've really what? provided a lot of value for society in the way of athleticism that uh -huh. has like oh, yeah. pushed the bar beyond what anyone could imagine. Yeah. And yeah. That's, that's why I was talking about the NBA and the NFL yeah. and the Olympics, man. A lot of these guys are like orange, green, indigo oh, guys who just come in here and dominate athletically. Yeah. It's really exciting to watch. You know me, I'm a big fan of football to see all these guys. I'm not saying all of them are from there, but it's just – it's it's interesting the way evolution works and yeah. the way I think the angels and all this other things work. I'm not saying slavery is yeah. a result of angel work, but there is still such good that can come on this planet. Yeah. Well, one of the things that shows is the potentials that are involved with hybrid hybridization. Yeah. So when you know the better members of mixed races hybridize and mate, they can produce new potentials, new new new. Uh, characteristics and strains that cannot be created any other way. Yeah, yeah, it's really exciting, actually. To see, <laughs> to, to see some of that. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay, so going on. Well, and the other thing, they, yeah, oh, they're going to mention it here. Okay, about the time the green man was killing off the orange race in Egypt, remember, we were talking about that earlier, and greatly weakening himself in so doing, this is the orange race, I mean, the wait, the green man was killing off the orange race in Egypt and greatly weakening, him, weakening himself, meaning the green race. They were so, fighting each other so, so much. so doing, they right. They were dying off. Right, right. The great black exodus started south through Palestine along the coast, following the same route. And later, when these physically strong indigo peoples overran Egypt, they wiped the green man out of existence by sheer force of numbers. These indigo races absorbed the remnants of the orange man and much of the stock of the green man, and certain of the indigo tribes were considerably improved by this racial amalgamation. So here they're talking about hybrids again, and also this they, their description of the indigo race, the physically strong indigo peoples. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that's what contributes to all this high-level athleticism that yeah. we see in professional sports. So. They followed the trail essentially came through Palestine, but a little further south, and then hit Egypt, and that's where they 
pick, picked up on some of the remnants of Orange and Green who had already mm -hmm. decimated themselves and just kind of cleaned up. Yeah. Just rolled right through them. But then, as we see, they didn't really stop there. Yeah, they continued down further south. So here we go with the next slide uh, about the Sahara civilization. Uh, the superior elements of the indigo race had their most progressive settlements in what is now the Great Sahara Desert which was fertile in those days, if you can imagine that. It looks pretty barren now, but oh, yeah. it was fertile at one point. It, it was fertile at that time. This indigo black group. Now, when they say indigo black, the black is the mixing of the green and orange with indigo. So you get the color that looks like black. Right. This indigo black group carried extensive strains of the submerged orange and green races. But then, long before Adam arrived, which is what, 30, 38,000 38, years ago. Long before Adam arrived, the blue men of Europe and the mixed races of Arabia had driven the indigo race out of Egypt and far south on the African continent, which is where they established themselves. So as we see, Egypt, but then driven south. Right. And coming further and further south. Right. Okay. Okay, so they had a teacher too. <laughs> it's like every one of these races had a has a, had a spiritual uh, teacher that was very significant. They say that isolated in Africa, the indigo race made isolated after they were driven south, uh, made little advancement until the days of Orvanon, when they experienced a great spiritual awakening. The God of Gods was proclaimed by Orvanon. Cool. So you wonder about these phrases like the God of gods or the great spirit, you know, or the truth. You Supreme know, chief. Supreme chief. All of these probably go back to the days of Calagastia. Dalmatia. I imagine, yeah. imagine and somehow yeah. were preserved and carried forward. Yeah. All right. So we're now going to move on to kind of a summary. We've been talking about all these migrations and all of that. No, this is how things ended up. As the, as the Sangic migrations draw to a close, the green and orange races are gone. The red man holds North America, the yellow man, Eastern Asia, the blue man, Europe, and the indigo race has gravitated to Africa. India harbors a blend of the secondary Sangic races, and the brown man, a blend of the red and yellow, holds the islands off the Asiatic coast. The purer Andenites live in the extreme northern regions of Europe and, I, and in Iceland, Greenland, and northeastern North America. I'll show all of them after this next Okay. Uh, so, yeah, just a little slide. more detail on that. An amalgamated race of rather superior potential occupies the highlands of South America. In Mexico, Central America, and in the mountains of South America, the later and more enduring civilizations were founded by a race predominantly red, but containing a considerable admixture of the yellow, orange, and blue. Okay, so we saw where they started from. We followed their migration patterns. We saw where blue ended up. We saw where red ended up in North America. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but now we're getting into also there's these pockets of amalgamated races mm -hmm. in uh, Central and South America that were kind of the predecessors to some other mm -hmm. civilizations like the Inca and the Maya and the Aztec yeah. things like that mixed with the red men and then later up stepped with others. Yeah, right. And then if we look into further North America, bear with me, if we see Northern Europe here or Western Europe where the blue man came across some of the Andenite trails, and we see some of these Andenite um, trails going through Greenland, Iceland, Finland, and into North America, where there was blending with red men and getting this kind of a little bit, yeah, getting a, a whole nother you know, like the Eskimo, so what, yeah, and then mixed with the red men, mm -hmm. where you get Andenite mixed with red men, right? So that's the best we could do to represent that one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, no, that's a, so that sort of sums up the summary. <laughs> okay, so. Uh, let's see. So then they comment. Um, they're talking about you know all this race blending and migration. They say there are no pure races in the world today. 
there's some mixing going on with everybody. In other words, we're mm -hmm. all carrying some kind of mix of. Yeah, keep keep in mind how long ago this all. Yeah, was. right. And we're talking about huge stretches of time. The early and original evolutionary peoples of color have only two representative races persisting in the world, the yellow man and the black man. And even these two races are much admixed with the extinct colored peoples. While the so-called white race is predominantly descended from the ancient blue man, it is admixed more or less with all other races. You know, so you think about colors, red, green, and blue mixed together makes white, right? And that's kind of, I mean, there's, other factors involved, but the, probably the white race is the most mixed of all. Mm -hmm. And that's mm -hmm. part of the reason why it's white, so-called. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're going to sort of conclude this section with one more interesting bit, which is about the writing mm -hmm. that evolved in these different groups. So they explain that the, the blue man was partial to alphabet writing, which went back to Dalmatia in the days of Caligassi. That's where they learned that. And they, they liked it. They were partial to alphabet writing and made the greatest progress along such lines. The red man preferred pictorial writing, while the yellow races used symbols for words and ideas, much like those they now employ. But the alphabet, and much more, was subsequently lost to the world. The Caligastia defection destroyed the hope of the world for a universal language, at least for untold ages. So that was part of the purpose of, Calig of the Caligastia project was to introduce a universal language so that all races would evolve using the same language, which meant they could have communicated and they eventually might have made peace with each other and, you know, we would have been off to a happier future. But Caligastia, like everything else, <laughs> he just mucked it up and we yeah. lost that potential. We'll get into the downfall of some of those yeah. potentials, but I think it's also interesting how then there was different languages within the same races. Uh huh. Oh yeah. And that was Got a barrier super, to peace. Super complicated. You yeah. look at Northern American red man. There were so many different tribes. That, yeah. 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 Right. It made communication very difficult. Yeah. But it's interesting to look at these samples, like the caves in Spain. You know, we were talking about the Cro-Magnon mm -hmm. in those regions. This this was taken from a cave in Spain. It's sort of a very early alphabet and then then the native americans is so cool with all their you know actually making little pictures and the early chinese i don't know i'm not chinese so i can't comprehend how they do this but to be able to, to you know remember and draw all of these yeah. symbolic uh representations is quite a thing yeah, absolutely anyway but looking to the future now moving on so they explain that the evolution of six colored races provides certain very desirable variations in mortal types and affords an otherwise unattainable expression of diverse human potentials. So this is part of the purpose behind these six colored races. On Urantia, these plans, so they're, what they're saying here is that this is true on all evolutionary worlds, that you, right. have, you have these varieties of races. Right for this purpose in that first paragraph. But then they say, on Urantia, <laughs> these plans for planetary progress and cultural advancement were well underway, proceeding most satisfactorily. And this was during the first 300,000 years of Caligastia's reign. Uh, were well underway, proceeding most satisfactorily when the whole enterprise was brought to a rather sudden and inglorious end by Caligastia's adherence to the Lucifer Rebellion. So that's the mucking it up. That's what brought it all down. Yeah, so what might have been possible with the colored races was made much more difficult as a result of this. So a lot of our racial problems these days actually stem back to, to 200,000 yeah, years. 200,000 years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And then they explain that mankind on Urantia must solve its problems of mortal development with the human stocks it has. But this fact does not preclude the possibility of the attainment of vastly higher levels of human development through the intelligent fostering of the evolutionary potential still resident in the mortal races. So to understand what they're saying here, we have to go back to the definition of evolution from the beginning of this podcast. 
And Which has purpose. Yeah. So there's evolutionary potential still resident in the human races that can be brought out through wise methods if we can figure those methods out. In the study of man's biologic evolution, now this is kind of a philosophic point they're making here, but I think we can still derive some wisdom from it, hopefully. In the study of man's biologic evolution on your rancher, there are grave objections to the exclusive historic approach to his present day status and his current problems. The true perspective of any reality problem, human or divine, terrestrial or cosmic, can be had only by the full and unprejudiced study of not only origin and history, but also destiny. Eternal ends are not shown in time beginning. So they're kind of telling us we can study the history and learn about the history, but that doesn't really tell us very much about our destiny, mm -hmm. you know, what the true human, what the true potentials are for the human civilization on this planet. So many other parts of the book, they talk about what those potentials are, but they're reminding us that we're not stuck where we are. There's right. still potentials within us that can be brought out so that the civilization on this world can reach higher levels. And that supports empowering us so that we're not yeah. feeling um, that we need to go back to anything right. like that. We can continue moving forward in the purpose of evolution. The, the design is supportive of moving forward Right, still. if we're able to uh, develop a perspective that looks into the future. And that's what I think they're pointing to here, to think about not only our own children, but our children's children and our grandchildren's grandchildren. You know what I mean? There's a even with our, in our own families and our own types of people, there are potentials reaching far into the future, which can be cultivated if we're aware of that and keep that in mind. So I think that's an important piece in all of this. Yeah. And then finally, they say that however your ranch immortals may differ in their intellectual, social, economic, and even moral opportunities and endowments, forget not that their spiritual endowment is uniform and unique. They all enjoy the same divine presence of the gift from the Father. So this is a perspective on race that I think is very important. You know, the word, we get a body, you know, we're born and we sort of, the luck of the draw, you know, and we all have things about our bodies that we like and maybe some things we don't like. But it's important to remember we're not stuck with this body. This body is very temporary. It gets us through this lifetime, but it's really more like a, scaffolding or a booster rocket or something that takes <laughs> us into the next life. And in the next life, we'll all have bodies that are tuned to spirit more completely. You know, when, you know if we go back and look at our podcast about future, you know, the Is our, life after death, life boring. After, right. what happens after you exactly, die, exactly. all of those. All that stuff yeah. kind of gives us a, a picture of where we're going after this life. So we're no longer dealing with this body at all. So it's kind of important, I think, to remember that, not to get too hung up on, you know, am I this or am I that or whatever, because, yeah. Yeah, yeah that, that's part of the um, destiny understanding. Yeah, right? that's part of the destiny understanding. We know where right. we're going, and so exactly. maybe we can ease our burdens a yeah. little bit here, knowing that we don't have to cram it all into here. Yeah. And if we don't have perfection right away, then yeah. we're a failure. Right, exactly. Because a lot of these racial inheritance things that we have we had no play in that yeah, we, we had have no decision we had no control yeah. no design whatsoever we just land in this body but yeah. what we can choose is going to spirit going to god yeah. mm -hmm. as all of these uh religious leaders anamanalan tan porshun tafanta yeah. all those guys talked about spirit and going yeah. to that spirit yeah all genuine spiritual teachers so that's the unifier for all of us races you know what i mean is yeah. that we can all be spiritually engaged and that's our destiny right so we might not look alike sound alike think alike act alike but spiritually we have that potential and destiny in us well like they say we all enjoy the same divine presence yeah we all have the presence of the of god within us and that's equal that's not conditioned or reduced or derived from race in any way. Yeah, that's not a reflective of class. Or, yep, right. As God does, has no respecter of persons, you know. It's, right. We're all in the same family. It's different mm -hmm. than class breakdown and race yeah. breakdown. And that'll be more clear in the next life. Yeah, yeah. But it's true here, too. Yeah. So we should all love each other and appreciate our differences. Yeah, that's the cool thing is appreciating the yeah. di unique diversity in yeah. all of this. The, the yeah. interesting experience we get on this planet. Yeah, imagine how boring it would be if we're all the same. Yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> yeah, totally.
All right, man. Well, cool. I really appreciate it. I hope you guys can tune in next time because we'll continue the story and we'll get into Dalmatia, Caligastia, the planetary prince. Rebellion. Rebellion. This is what touches on uh, the modern day Anunnaki. When mm, you hear cool. people talk about Anunnaki and things like that, that's the planetary yeah. prince and the corporeal staff. So we'll get more yeah. into it. We'll talk about the Nodites, a whole nother race. Yeah. And there's just a ton of stuff to cover here. So and thanks for being And there's a lot in human uh, legends and mythology that talk about what we're oh, going to yeah. be talking yeah. about next week. And we'll pull them or out. Or next time, rather. Yeah. <laughs> we'll <laughs> pull them out. I wish it would out. be a week. But <laughs> we'll pull them out and we'll find it. And yeah. we'll make our, our cross-references. And hopefully it will empower our viewers right. to be able to have language around this stuff. Right. Because it's fascinating, these echoes from so long ago. Yeah. It's yeah. still carried forward into the present. All right. Yeah. Well, I hope you see us in the future. Yeah. And thanks again, Chuck, for all the hard sure. work. Yeah. Thanks for joining us. And thanks for joining us, guys. We'll see you next time. Okay.